You may want to clap well for the King of Kings, the one you just sang unto, the one we just eulogized, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who does mouth blowing things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a privilege to be here this evening. You can have your seats in God's presence. Ah, I saw that we had some guests, but they've now gone. <laughs> I was just about to welcome them. <laughs> That's okay, that's okay. Hallelujah. How many of us were here last week? Okay, so a number of people not here last week. Um, so last week we started a series, and we were really looking at the four little things. So call them the, the wonders or, or whatever, but by the wisdom of God, we, we have these little things situated in Scripture. For us to learn from. So God doesn't think that despite the fact that we were made in his image, we cannot learn from these little things. And that's what we're going to continue this evening. Four little things. Our foundation scripture is Proverbs 30. And I'd like us to read together. Proverbs 30 from verse 24. Proverbs 30 from verse 24 to 28. Media, are you helping me? Proverbs 30. From 24, I'll, I'll just read. It says, There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The cottonies are but a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet they go, yet go they forth, all of them by bands. And then verse 28, The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's places. All these four things are little things if you were just to look at the size. If you were to look at them with the naked eye, they're very little. But the Bible chose this four for us to learn from. Now, the context I'd like to build tonight, a bit different from what we did last week, is just to cast our minds to something that I think heaven will have us really focus on. And the context I'd like to build tonight is the context around purpose. A lot of speakers not necessarily in church, say when the purpose of a thing is unknown, abuse is inevitable. So if, you, if you've never seen a microwave and you buy a microwave, it could do different things for you. You could use it as a store, you keep your things there. You could use it as a table, put your things on top of it. The day you put it on and the thing is, is moving, boom, boom, you can even run away. Um, I remember once, probably last year, my mom was boiling beans to the pressure cooker. And when the thing was done and the alarm went off, my house helped to crease. Like one day. Because she had never seen that. She didn't understand that what that is saying to the cook is I'm ready or I'm almost ready. And therefore she 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 took um <laughs> she she picked risk. I also once met a young lady, I had gone to do my nails in a spa, who said to me, Oh, she had gone to her boyfriend's house and she was just hearing psst, psst. So the boyfriend had left his keys for her to just enter and wait for me. She was hearing psst. Then she just said she was sure that the guy was going to use her for money ritual. That's how she locked the door and ran out and waited for the guy outside, ready to call the neighbors. Guess what was doing? Psst. Is air fresh now? So she said, the guy now said, ah, do my disgrace me now. Okay, we will leave. Because she was like, where will I tell them I went? <laughs> that they will now use me for money ritual. So it's important that we all know purpose. And as much as there's a universal purpose for human beings, the Bible says, that God said, let us make man in our own image. The Bible says man was created in the image of God and we were made to have dominion. If you go with me very quickly to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Um, I'm going to just speed ahead. Media, please help me. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over all the creeping thing that creepeth. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created the male and female. So God had an intention for you and I to dominate. We were supposed to have dominion. But then it makes us know further down as you then move to the New Testament, or even further down the Old Testament, that the purpose was not just universal. There was individual purpose that God walked into each of us. It says in Colossians 1.16, Colossians 1.16, it says, By him were all things created that are in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers. Pause there, say like that everything was created by him, first of all. All things were created by him and for him. So the joint to the universal purpose is the fact that first and foremost, we were here to serve his purpose. Now let me read message version, and I'm going to refer a lot to message version. I normally say to myself, what's the difference between Wednesday and Sunday? I think Wednesday we should open the Bible, we should write, you know, we should really dig, you know, things that we may not be able to do on Sunday. Message version. It says, for everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank, after rank of angels, everything God started in him and finds its purpose in him. You and I can only ever find purpose in Jesus. How do you know that? Why do the wealthiest of people commit suicide? And I have people in my circle who sort of believe that ah, money solves a lot. Why do people that seem to have everything, career is moving, you are very popular, you have not really run into trouble, your money is intact, your home is intact, and the next thing you hear, the person has committed suicide. Because there is something, there's a void in you and I, and it's only God that can fill that void. So the more we run away from him, God, the more that we find ourselves empty. Like, you know, what exactly am I here for? What, why am I created? I want you to have that at the back of your mind. And then the last version I'll read, the Living Bible. It says, Christ himself is the creator who made everything in heaven and earth. The things we can see and the things we can't. The spirit world with its kings and kingdoms, its rulers and authorities, all were made by Christ for his own use and glory. Father, tonight we, we pray that you would, you would speak to each and every one of us. Your word makes us know that your, your word is living. We ask that this living word will instruct us tonight, will convict us tonight, will reassure us tonight, will direct us in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit of God, your word tells us that in your presence there's fullness of joy and there's liberty. We ask for liberty of the word even tonight to be broken into the hearts of men and women here present and those ones online in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone said you were made by God and for God and until you understand that life will never make sense. So if you're here and you're sort of dwelling in that valley of indecision, indecisiveness, you know, why, why am I going to church? Am I just following people? The truth is, the reason that you were made is the reason that you can have a good life on earth. Outside Christ, there's no life. And in addition to that, there are several references in scriptures that make us know that God is intentional about each and every one of us. There are specific things that God has put in Pastor Yinka that Pastor Yomi Agiri does not have. God is intentional. There are specific things God has put in Dickiness Bumi that Dr. Lacey will not have. God is intentional like that. And God seeds us like arrows on earth to attend to different kinds of issues, to solve different kinds of problems. Let's go to Exodus 31. This was when God was giving instructions about the tabernacle. Exodus 31, 1 to 6. God spoke to Moses, and I'm reading from message because I, I really want to break it down. God spoke to Moses. He said, see what I have done. I have passed son of Uri, son of her, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the spirit of God, giving him skill and know-how and expertise in every kind of craft to create designs and work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set gemstones, to carve wood. He's an all-around craftsman. Not only that, but I've given him Oholiab, son of Ahimasak, of the tribe of Dan, to work with him. Here we see, as an example, where God had deliberately 
put into the life of a man, put in the hands of a man, specific things to answer to an issue that he probably did not know was going to come when, you know, he realized that he had those skills. So God is very deliberate about us. And it says further in Romans 12, 46, it says, in this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. That's all of us. We're like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body does not get its meaning from each part. Each part gets its meaning from the body. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. But as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be. Without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we're not. So I really want to cement, I want to sow something in your heart tonight that God is not erratic. He's not an ad hoc God. God does not shoot from his hips. God does not scratch his head in surprise. Like, oh, now what are we going to do with her? No, 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 God is intentional. And he deliberately puts in each and every one of us what we require for the journey he has planned for us. There are times, as this version of scripture rightfully puts it, that we're enviously comparing ourselves with other people. And that means you think they have something that you would rather have. So you are going there wondering why they didn't give you. Or you're pridefully comparing yourself, in which case you're thinking you're superior. And, oh my God, I came with everything. They don't have anything. No, sir. No, ma. You came with what you required for your part of the journey. I was once watching a movie... Um, this young man w was trying to talk to a, a lady. She was shunning him. I can't remember the details. And he said, oh, by the way, you didn't make yourself beautiful. So you have no right to be proud about it. And I thought, word. <laughs> I mean, come on. Did you create yourself? No, no, you didn't. You, this is how you came. So some of those things are already there as, 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 um, as we are, as, as human beings. And therefore, we can't be envious or prideful. Now... One more scripture and then we dig. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11. Again, I read from, I think what I've copied here is message. 1 Corinthians, 4, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11. It says, God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit of God to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin, but they're handed out one by one, by the one spirit of God. He decides who gets what and when. So I, I really want this to be at the back of our minds as we then go into the creature that we're looking at this evening. The fact that God is very purposeful, God is very intentional. There are many, and I mean, I, I kept, you know, putting scripture, putting scripture, and I thought, okay, that's enough. You won't have enough time. Because I really wanted you to see that your life is not accidental. My life is not accidental. It's true I don't have a full picture. For some of us, if we had the full picture, we would not even leave our beds, right? We'll beg not to be born. I, I bet you if Joseph knew that he would have to go to prison, he would have to be a slave, he would have to be forgotten in prison after he had helped people. I think if he knew that, he would rather just stay with his daddy. Like, let's just stay here. But he didn't know. So we don't know the full picture. But you have to be trusting that what you require for the journey they gave you, and you actually have arrived with it. I thought that was important. We, we're about 7 billion on earth right now. 7 billion. I think that's what statistics say. And scientists have not been able to find two people with the same fingerprints. You know, at times I wonder, for atheists and for scientists that deny the existence of God, I wonder, what exactly are you thinking? <laughs> that there has not been a mistake. That they've now discovered that ah, these two people are now the same. Even twins. Even identical twins. 
They're different because their purpose is unique. God can call them to support each other, but their purpose is unique. However, despite all this, despite the fact that God equipped us with what we will need, the Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And earthen vessels are you and I. Earthen vessels are imperfect. Earthen vessels are work in progress. Earthen vessels can be broken. Despite the fact that God loaded us, despite the fact that we arrived with what we required for the journey, we are earthen vessels. And it's good that we remember that. Now, if God created us and he had a purpose for us, then all of us should really be excited because it means that last, last, we'll be okay. You don't think so? Please, you can answer. You don't think so? If, if God created me and he created my journey and he knows tomorrow and he answers prayers and he's the owner of the universe, it means last, last. I'll be, I'm okay. Right? But the journey, you know, and on the journey, some people lose hands, some people lose their legs, some people, their hip is broken, but last, last, you, you'll be fine. Um, I heard a speaker say that, a preacher say that, even if you don't believe that God has a purpose for your life, the devil does. So that's why he will fight you. And what a shame it is that you that are supposed to be the believer. Some of us are probably more unbelievers than people that we call unbelievers. Because if you really were to believe the word of God, if you really were to believe, God will say what he said he would do. He would do what he said he would do rather. If you really believed the words, the prophecies from here, this year is a year of restoration, refreshment. If you really believed all that, your life would be a bit different. So if you don't, the devil does. And therefore, whether you realize it or not, we fight. So if you now decide, I'm not going to fight, I'm just going to be, if I don't trouble the devil, he won't trouble me, you are kidding. Because the fact that you already have a promise hanging over your head is enough for the devil to fight you. That's it. If I can frustrate the purpose of God in this one's life, I would have won one for hell. So if you don't believe it, the devil does believe it. So it is therefore against this background that we then go again into the animal kingdom. But I wanted us to just, you know, be crystal clear in our minds. God created me for a purpose. And it's not just the universal purpose of having dominion on earth. It's a very specific call, a very specific purpose that he has created for me. I, I spent some time reflecting on why are we constantly being asked to just go and learn from this, go and learn from that. God created the animals. And I believe my theory is that he wove into, you know, some different animals, different attributes that he would have us go learn at some point in our journey. Just in case you don't know what something looks like, you know, you get pointed to an animal. In fact, Job said to his friends, and we don't have to go there, I'll read it from message. He was talking to his friends when the buhaha happened. He said, but ask the animals what they think. Let them teach you. Let the birds tell you what's going on. Put your ear to the earth. Learn the basics. Listen. The fish in the ocean will tell you their stories. Isn't it clear they all know and agree that God is sovereign? Because even in his own situation, he realized that maybe at times, animals get what as human beings we fail to get. Probably because our life is, um, is, is a bit complex. And there's a bit of the mind involved in what we try to do. So as we get into the world of conies today, and that's, the, that's what we are going in today. It's the second part of our foundational scripture. It's uh, verse 26. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make their houses in the rocks. So as we, go, as, as we do that today, I want you to have at the back of your mind that God is very purposeful. And if you're sitting here and, you know, in your mind you're wondering, mm, 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 all of us are just general, everything is accidental, it's not true. There is a purpose and there's a reason for you being here. And the ultimate end is for you to fulfill your purpose here on earth. That's why Paul could say, I have fought a good fight. Because he identified with the purpose that had been created for him and he did get into it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, um, King James calls these animals conies. But if you were to look in today's Google to just search them out, because I had to do that to learn about them, you would, you would see them being referred to in different forms. In, in some versions of scripture, they're called mammoths. 
in some they're called hyrax. In Google, that's what you're likely to find. You're not likely to find connies as an animal, or the references will be very little. Connies are also known as mammoths or small rabbits. They look like guinea pigs. They are small, they're furry, they've got, they've, they're furry, I think. They've got lots of fur, and they're defenseless. Just talking about the animal now. The immediate thing the Bible calls out in its small wonder section is that connies are feeble, or like some versions put it, vulnerable. When you're vulnerable, you're open to attack, you're open to being destroyed by virtue of attack. Yet they live in rocks. That's what the Bible calls out. Connies are mentioned only two times in the Bible, same thing with the ants, so you don't find a lot of reference to them all over the place. And, you know, um, some research says they're, they're related to elephants. In fact, they refer to them as cousins to elephants. They live up to 15 years, four times longer than most small animals. Now, the second reference of Connies is found in Psalm 104, and it says exactly the same thing, or it makes reference to exactly the same thing. Psalm 104, verse 18 it says, the high hills are a refuge for the wild goats and the rocks for the conies. So again, referring to the fact that conies live in high hills and rocks. So just so that we have some theoretical background to what we're doing. Um, if you were to ask yourself how many kinds of animals are on earth, you will discover that there are indeed millions. Millions are kind of species. But when you dig into scriptures and you're looking for the different animals that reference is made to you find about 120 so it's not the bible does not actually talk about every single animal it talks about some specific animals for specific reasons and the con is therefore one of these 120 so we should pay attention it's not um accidental so remember that our quest this evening is wisdom because that's what the bible makes reference to there's an implication here that the conies are wise, that's why they live in the rocks, and I'm going somewhere. The question is, what kind of wisdom is that? Why do they make their home in the rocks and all that? And what is the wisdom in it? In my, um, in my discovery about conies and my reflections, and, and what I think God will have us um, stay on tonight, there's this thing about conies themselves being conscious of their nature. They understand their own limitation, the fact that they can be prey, and prey, P-R-E-Y, to different kinds of animals. They, they are open to, the, to different kinds of dangers, so they seek shelter in what they consider to be bigger than themselves. That's the first thing. The cony has no claws. The way it's described, the feet are very soft, pedaled. They don't really have anything to defend themselves, so they run to the rock. The Connie's specific enemies include things like leopards, hawks, um, eagles, and for as long as the Connie is inside the rock, those enemies can't get them. I'm going somewhere. The Connie's can build a castle for themselves, but they can run into one that has been built already. Just as an intro. I would Iraq or the Connie. So what, what will heaven have us glean from this? The first thing is that the Connie or the Hyrax is aware of itself and its own limitations. I mentioned that earlier. In fact, I think that if the Connie felt it was a match for the enemy, it would stay, right? If the enemy is coming and you're like, my Buria Bombi, you will just stay, say that I will fight you. I, I will fight you, you know. It will stay in the face of the enemy and what will happen to it? It will perish. The Connie realizes it doesn't have any physical defenses. Hence, it does the needful. It doesn't just run there. It actually lives in the rocks. It comes out every now and then for sunlight to, you know, when it's thirsty. But that's where it lives. Awareness in this regard extends to what we, are, what we know of our state. Right? So, you, there are different states that we all are at different points in time. It's not just about awareness of yourself. It's also what state are you currently. A lot of us deny our weaknesses or limitations or state. Some of us spiritualize it. Like I can, I can take it, big deal. Actually, weakness is part of how we were designed and therefore, there is no reason to deny your weakness. Because if the Bible says, my strength is made perfect in weakness, if you are not weak in any way, then you're not going to need his grace. Abi, you, will you need grace if you are perfect? You will need grace. So weakness is part of the design. And therefore, we need to be acutely aware 
of our limitations, acutely aware of our state. Some defend their state or their, you know, their limitation. Some excuse themselves. Some hide it. Some resent it. If that is what we do, then we cannot act. If the hierarchs sort of thought, I know I'm small, but in my mind I'm very big. I'm going to wait and see what wonder this leopard wants to do. It's gone. It's a goner. So the hierarch says, okay, I, you know, danger is coming. I'm going to run. That's why it can act effectively. The true and effective action comes only when we are aware of what, of what our package came with. God is not impressed with self-sufficiency. You know, in the world, in, in the corporates, I, I've worked for a few years now, almost three decades, and it's probably not always okay to show vulnerability. How many of, how many of us agree with me tonight? That you, you almost have to limit your level of vulnerability. But the truth is, in the kingdom of heaven, showing God your vulnerability actually shows him that you are serious. I heard a man of God saying this evening, when I was just, you know, researching and preparing, and he said, to them I may be a man of God, to you I am still your boy. God needs us in that state, because that is the state that we can actually do what is needful. If we are in a state of trying to hide, trying to um, diminish what is actually a true limitation, or a true weakness, or a state of backsliding, that you should be aware of and do something about, but you're busy trying to cover it, you will not actually be able to do exactly what you should be doing with it. The heroes of Bible are men and women that were able to substantially actually um, embrace their states, their helpless states, their weak states. God is interested in us knowing where we are because he knows where we are already. So when he was talking to Adam in Genesis 3, Genesis 3 verse 9, and the Lord said to him, Adam, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? Who was that question for? You can answer me. I can't see your mouth. You are wearing mask. Adam. That question was for Adam. It wasn't for God. God knew where Adam was. The question is, do you know where you are? Do you have an understanding of your current state? Rahab, when she was negotiating with the spies, in Joshua 2 verse 11 said, As soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. If you are afraid and you decide, I'm not going to say I'm afraid because there's no fear in God. You probably will not do anything about it. Guys, when we heard stories about you and the fact that we we're conscious, she was talking about the spies, actually our hearts melted because we heard everything that God had already done about you. David, after his first um, uh, denial with Nathan, eventually got to a point, Psalm 51 verse 4. It says, Against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. David got to that point of ownership, ownership of his state, ownership of his weakness. Moses in Exodus 4 verse 10. This was actually, I mean, I continue to be intrigued by the person of Moses. When we get to heaven, he's on my... You know, he's on my own list of the people I'm going to try to meet first. Because I'm just intrigued by his life. <laughs> the Bible says, this man said to God, it's not me you're talking to, you know I stammer. So there's an understanding. A number of us will boldly embrace um, promotion, and there's nothing wrong with that. Boldly embrace upliftment, boldly embrace positions and status without an awareness of our states. And if you cannot actually fully embrace, fully understand, fully really realize where you are, you can grow. Moses said to God, Oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken to your servant. Even from the last time you spoke to me, I'm still stammering. That's what Moses was saying. But I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue. I think that God values us in a place where we acknowledge our humaneness. Because his strength is made perfect in weakness. I didn't read that scripture earlier. It's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. The idea is not to go looking for a list of weaknesses that don't exist. That's not what I'm saying. So I don't want you to make up a whole list of, ah, I am bad. I'm the baddest. That's not what I'm talking about. It is to have an objective, grounded, and godly understanding of who you are and where you are. 
It is to have a grounded understanding, an objective and grounded and godly understanding of who you are and where you are. The Bible impresses upon us that Connie's are aware, they, they understand that in this matter, unless I run from this guy, he will eat me. So even if I am standing in my rightful place, in that point in time that there is danger, I'm aware of who I am. I asked a cheeky question. Have you asked yourself, why did Joseph flee? Why did he run? Why didn't he stay there? And command the devil. In fact, why didn't, she, why didn't he say, Madam, please leave me alone. I just want to clean this shelf and go. And continue with his work. Eh? Maybe, I don't know. There's no something. I'm just saying. But the man ran. So the first thing is to know yourself. Now the second thing that I've put here is you have to be sensitive to danger when danger is lurking around. You, you have to acknowledge that something is dangerous. Because if you don't acknowledge it, then you can play with it. Then you can rationalize it. Then you can try and you know, build things around it. If you are, there's no acknowledgement that ah, this is now dangerous, this is dangerous. Reading about and studying corners, you see that they come out to get sunlight and drink water and all that, but actually their home is in the rocks. Baby Jesus was taken away from the enemies. Why didn't God just save him there? Matthew 2, 13. Matthew 2, verse 13. Can we read that? Matthew 2, verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord, it's talking about the Magi, the, the wise men. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, says, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. Why? This is the son of the most high God. This is the representative of God on earth. Why is he fleeing? <laughs> Why is he running? Are there times we see danger, we smell danger, we can touch danger, but we decide we can handle it? I think the answer is yes. We can see by, by all interpretation of this thing there that this is dangerous. And we say, I have the spirit of God inside me. I can take it. Matthew 2.13 says, Joseph received an instruction to take Jesus and run. Some of the kind of dangers that we face every day. Remember, I wanted us to watch that video because it paints a vivid picture. It shows you vividly, okay, leopard is coming, I, I, I sort of jack by like that. But in, in our lives, we don't see animals from the zoo break open to come and attack us. Because the war that we're fighting is not a physical war. A lot of us sort of forget, especially if you see human beings almost wearing the, 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 um, the English has gone, but I'm trying to say something. <laughs> the apparel of Satan. And you just assume that they are now Satan. Our war is not physical. You're not going to see an animal break away from the zoo and start to chase you and therefore that is the danger. It's not. So you'll be dealing with things like loss of the eyes, loss of the flesh, pride of life. Those are the things. They are not sin, but they wreck the same kind of havoc. The animal that the, the Hyrax saw and ran was going to kill it for food. Same thing with these things that we don't run from. These things kill our spiritual lives. <laughs> Dangers have the tendency of snuffling out the life out of its victim. In fact, in layman's language, your danger could be your friend. Your danger could be your company of friends. But why is that dangerous? What do you mean? Because if you live with certain people, you commune with certain people continuously, they leave you in a state of covetousness and envy and not wanting to go to church and not wanting to read your Bible and not wanting to acknowledge God. That is taking the life out of you. The same way it's taking the life out of you. The Bible says in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Now, it's not like they keep a present for you and therefore they bless you with it. But because you don't do those things, you are blessed. You don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Maybe you are walking, you are still sort of walking, you haven't made up your mind. You don't now stand in the way of sinners or sit with the scornful. That's what makes you blessed. 
He says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. If you are doing these three things, your delight cannot be in the law of the Lord. Show me your friends, I'll tell you who you are. So if you are walking in the counsel of the ungodly, if you are standing in the way of sinners or sitting in the seat of the scornful, you will not be delighting in the way of the Lord. Verse 3, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever it with shall prosper. So it can be friends. I'm still talking about the hierarchs recognizing when danger is around. It could also be a habit. Habits can be the danger. Because a man becomes what he thinks, and usually our habits form a pattern that eventually dictates the trajectory of our lives. Everything, something you do every day, every day, every day, that's what your mind is preoccupied with. There's someone close to me who, who said to me, and it happened to me actually a while back, that when she has read some novels, you know, she, in fact, she said to me once, she was, there's a, there's an author called Karen Kingsbury. She writes Christian novels, very good Christian novels. But she said she found herself praying for the character in the novel. And that she had prayed before she, she was like, what's that? So in this particular novel, there was this Christian boy, Christian girl. They were dating and they were not sleeping together. But they were now caught together in the same house. And I think that's where she stopped at that point in time. And she went for a prayer meeting. She was praying for, for the characters in the book. So what you do constantly, it becomes what you think about. And then that's it. That's the way your life eventually goes. Study successful people, spiritual people or secular people. Their secret is in their habits. Their secret is in their stories, the stories of their lives. When you want to ask Dan Gote a question, ask him what he does from morning till night. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? You can make a habit of porn watching. And when I say a habit, more often than not, a habit is what you now start to do without even thinking about it anymore. It's like the people that drive. You don't enter your car and start to think, where is the gear? Where is the brake? No, no, no. It's a, you drive, so you are used to it. You make a habit of porn watching. That, that danger has gripped you already. You make a habit of masturbating. That danger has gripped you already. You make a habit of leaving yourself constantly in debt. There's no point in time in your life that you can say today, I'm not owing anybody. And when I'm not talking about owing for house. So I'm not talking about owing to buy Uber or something or to buy a car. If, if the car is that important at that point of your life, the danger has gripped you already. You can't concentrate at work. You can't give meaningfully to the things of God because now you are in debt now. So you come to church with whatever is left from whatever is left after you have paid all your debts. That thing has gripped you. That's a danger. You make a habit of eating other people's homes or earnings. I, I really couldn't find the English to, to do this. What I mean by that is you make a habit of, um, of flirting with other people's partners. You say, no, no, I'm not doing anything. But you, you are constantly suggesting things. You are playing with people's minds. Either their husbands or their wives. Procrastination. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Taking the grace of God for granted. I'm, I'm just speaking to some of the habits that can eventually become the danger that wants to snuff the life out of you. Similar to that video you watched. Living in known sin. You can make it a habit of feeding from leftovers. What do I mean by that? You are coasting along in your Christian life. You don't have any personal life. What you eat is what is served on Wednesday and what is served on Sunday. And I'm not saying it's not good. I mean, when I say leftover, in inverted commas. So you have made a habit of living your life on scraps. Like whatever they say in church, that's it. You don't seek out God for yourself. You make a habit of comparing. You make a habit of lying, not keeping your word. The Bible says, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. But you have so made it a habit that when you say good morning to people, they have to look out and confirm what's happening outside. Because most likely it's not morning. You, your, your word is not your bond. Each of these habits I've mentioned to very different degrees, but they leave you in a place where you are not as committed to spiritual things as you should be. And when you are not growing, you are dying. 
If you are not growing, if you are not increasing, you are likely decreasing. In life, there is no, I'm standing on one position, nothing can happen to me because this is where I am. More often than not, you are moving backwards. The Bible says in Romans 12 verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is a way to build a habit. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We talked about purpose at the beginning. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, and the point we're looking at, the second point we're looking at is really speaking to you being able to acknowledge and be sensitive to danger when it's around. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 9 to 11, and I've, I've, I've done this now in message, but you can put up the King James Version, please. 1, 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 11. It says, but it's, if it's only, yeah, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Ten, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Eleven, please. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. So the picture I want, you to have, I want you to have in your mind is one that says, if there is danger, I have a responsibility to take off. If there is danger and I acknowledge it, and I've read you some things, your own may not be on that list, it may be something else. If there is something that is constantly snuffing out the life of God in you, that is dangerous. That is dangerous. The Bible says we should not be unequally yoked for a reason. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness. And then Joseph, we talked about him earlier. I want to read it. Genesis 39.12-13. to 13. And she caught him by his garment. Genesis 39.12-13. to 13, Saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled. Now what does that mean? He went through some discomfort. He went through some status reduction. He went through some suffering. He fled without his garment. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment she, and was fled forth. I won't continue. Now, I wanted to see what this thing said in Yoruba. So I went to the Yoruba Bible. Genesis 39, 11. And I'm going to attempt to read what I saw. Niojokon. Joseph Ulosinu Ilela Tiloshe what I thought I was going to see was Osi Jakba. <laughs> That's why I went to check the real revival. But I wanted to create an impression in your head that Osi Jade. Because at times, English can be very proper, you know, you can flee. Osajade, it can, it can lack decorum. It can be that you now don't have dignity, but Osajade, he ran away. That, is, that should be the, the way you and I deal with danger. And danger here is not physical. Anything that has the um, potential of reducing your spiritual stature, you should flee from it. And like I said, it can be habits, it can be friends, it can be family, it can be Netflix and chill, it can be Instagram. I said to myself one day, ah, this thing, this thing is, a, is an instrument of the devil. I can, I can feel it. Because very, very conveniently, you can sit down on Instagram for one hour. It's not a home video. It's just going, going, shoo, bag, Ankara, hair, uh, uh, some jokes, you will laugh, then you continue. I'm like, ah! Can you even dedicate that time to saying, I just want to study my Bible. So whatever has a potential, and what is good is good, but to, if it's excessive, it is bad, it's dangerous. And if you don't have the discipline, therefore, maybe you shouldn't do it. 
Maybe you should imbibe some habits that says, Monday and Tuesday, I live clean. I don't pick my, I don't do anything on social media. Because maybe you can't do without social media. It's where the world is going. If you work in an organization that is tech, blah, blah, blah. But you can detox yourself on social media. You can detox yourself. You can stop going from one Facebook page to another, to another. And in your mind, building up things. That is why a woman will get home and say to her husband, did you not see that uh, some people are on holiday? Did you, how is, uh, how is Pastor Yinka doing it? Chebitu is a man of God. And I can see that he's doing it well. Why, how come you cannot do that? Because you have fed your mind with all these things. All these things that say, muwa, 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 bring it, bring it, bring it. Increase it, increase it, increase it. Give me more, give me more, give me more. That's it. What are you going to sit on, let's say on Instagram, for one hour watching that will feed your spirit? If you find it, sit there. But if it's not feeding your spirit and it is pure entertainment, what are you doing there? It's danger. The fleeing may not be this vivid. It may be subtle. But it can also be this vivid. It can be as bad as you actually blocking somebody's number on your phone. The day I discovered that thing was like, oh, freedom. I don't know whether they know you've blocked them. Or I haven't, do they know you've blocked them? Eh? Will they know? After a while, they will know. They will know because every time they call me, I'm, I'm busy. I can be busy. But, but my point is, if, 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 if I mean, if you, are, if you are born of the Spirit of God, you know, as many as I live by the Spirit of God, they're sons of God, you can tell when, when something is actually a weight on your spiritual life. Block somebody's number. Or have the conversation that says this relationship is not working. Somebody that professed love to you is supposed to be a Christian, but every time you guys sit together, it's either you're talking about money and how you're going to buy somebody's bag and somebody's kind of belt, or he's trying to touch you. You don't need a prophet. You do not need a prophet to tell you, sorry, this one is not taking me to where they asked me to go. It's not your partner on that journey. So cut people off. It may also involve you dropping some jobs. Like, I'm sorry, I quit. They say, do you have another job? Guys, let's be clear. I'm not asking people to now go and be penniless. My point is, if the devil has strategized, and the devil is, strat is a strategist, he's just not as good as God. <laughs> do you understand? The devil is a strategist. If he has strategized to surround you with, when you're at work, you'll always give bribe. When you're at home, you don't, then you, your life is not going anywhere. You need to take a decision. So you may, you may have to leave a high-paying job and find something that's not as high-paying. Maybe don't make it as drastic. Start to look for a job. If on the job that you are on, there is always that thing that will make you fall. It may be you breaking a relationship, stopping to receive bribes, saying the truth. Like the high rats, you two may have come out for some sunshine. I just came to work. I just came to hustle. But you, you should flee at the sight of danger. You should not stay with danger trying to negotiate with danger. Like, okay, don't touch me. Don't touch me again. No, 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 don't. no. What, what are you doing there? What are you doing there? You should flee. David could actually have done the same thing when he saw Bathsheba. Bathsheba. He could have done the same thing now. Like in Yoruba, they would say, So sin was not the sin. It is the fact that you now decide to act on it. So your, 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 your legs can help you flee, run. David could have done the same thing and maybe the story would have been different. In fact, Joseph was in a deeper mess. Joseph was approached. David was the one that approached the danger. Joseph was approached, you understand. Despite this though, God still had mercy on David. So that, that's the point. The third one, and I've made two points now. The first one is the fact that you need to know where you are, who you are. The second one is recognize danger. The third point is the fact that provision has already been made for you. Why are you trying it on your own? The con is not trying to build. It hides itself in a provision that has already been made. It's not building a rock. It's just hiding in the rock. Last week we said the ants were building, but the conies are not building. In what ways are you and I trying to erect our own? When a provision has been made. The Bible says in Psalm 61, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. Psalm 61 from 1 to 3. From the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee. My heart, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me and a strong tower. 
We should be entering the rest that has been promised for us. And that is referenced in Hebrews 4. In what ways do we try to do our own thing when we should not be? In what ways are you and I trying to, to duplicate or complicate what God has already done? You know, in some, in some sects, in, even in some Pentecostal denominations, there's this thing about you paying for your sin. You can't pay for your sin, no. You cannot pay for your sin. You, there's nothing. There is no other blood that can be shed apart from the one that has been shed. It's the blood of Jesus. We try to revenge wrongs that have been done to us. I thought our father said, revenge is mine. I will repay. So when, one thing I've seen about God is, if you allow him to fight for you, I don't know how to say this as it's going to not sound heretical, but God fights dirty. As in, God fights. I remember once I was making a presentation, I, don't, I, can't, I can't recall if I've shared it here, and I had this man, this young man, Muslim, I don't know, he just came and he said this, that, I mean, and at that point in time, I just started a job, a new job, and it totally just messed up what I had just been saying. Ah, when you don't have power, you just go to God, you know? So I, in that moment, I sort of whispered, everyone, you just have to do something. So when it was now, it's time to present. That's how Projector decided not to walk home. They did, oh, they did, 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 did me across my leg, oh. Like, if you recognize, if you ask about me, they'll tell you that she's a Christian, then you will know that you shouldn't do that. I've discovered that when God fights for you, he fights well. So we lose a part of the deal when we try to do the revenge. You mess it up. You don't have idea. You think you have idea. You don't have idea. When God decides to do his own thing, he does it so big. <laughs> think of him, man. <laughs> he does it big. We, we strive, we fight, we claw for promotion and success. When the Bible says the, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to me, why don't we just believe that? The Bible says our lives is hid, for ye are dead, Colossians 3.3, 3, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Like the rock badger, also another name that the hierarchs is called, this is where our lives are, we hide in Christ. So Jesus indeed is our rock, and that's where I'm going to leave it tonight. Jesus indeed is our rock. In Exodus 17.6, it says, Behold, I will stand before thee, there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water. And this was Moses having a conversation. It was God having a conversation with Moses. What I want to leave us with is something that says, when you search scriptures, a lot of times, Jesus, our salvation is referred to as the rock. In Exodus 33, 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory pass, that I will put you in the cleft of a rock. Moses was saying in his valedictory speech, Deuteronomy 32, 31, he says, for their rock, small r, is not as our rock, big r. So Jesus is the rock of our salvation. And in 1 Corinthians 10, it then brings it all back. Moreover, brethren, from verse 1, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all did eat the same spiritual meat. They did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, capital letter R, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The significance of Jesus as our rock is this. Jesus is immovable. You should be immovable. If you and I hide in him, we are immovable. Jesus is our defense. Imagine a rock that you are hiding behind. In Psalm 18, David says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. Jesus is your fortress. He's your deliverer. He's the one in whom you can hide when things are not great. He's the one that is bigger than you that can be your shield even when you're fighting a war. Jesus is solid. Jesus is firm. He's unbreakable. He's immovable. No man is a rock. So that is why we need Jesus as our rock. Most of us are unstable. <laughs> you say something today, tomorrow, maybe you don't mean it again. Some wishy-washy, some insecure, some movable like a feather. But when we place our faith on the rock that is Jesus, then it stabilizes us and it settles us. 
And out of this same rock came water, refreshing. When we are tired from the journey, when things have hurt us, when people have hurt us, when you have believed people that you had no business believing, Jesus is the rock that supplies the water, the water of life, that refreshes you, that re-energizes you. What are you trying to deal with yourself? Why is Christ your plan B? That's actually an insult. That's a big insult. If in your mind and in your calculation of where you want to go, of what you want to do in life, you have Jesus as plan B, you shouldn't have him at all. Jesus is the rock. He is the plan. He's our fortress. There's a designated state for you in the rock, and that is where you should be. You should constantly be in the rock. The rock that satisfies, the rock that protects, the rock on which you and I can stand. So as we wrap up this evening, I'd like to ask you three questions. And the first one is, who are you? Do you understand? The second question is, where are you? What's your state? The Bible talks about examining yourself. So it's not bad to sort of take, a, take, a, take an audit and just try to think about where you are. And the third question is, are you, are, you, are you still trying to do things on your own? Or are you continuing to strike the rock after the first time it was struck, like Moses did? The Bible says in Matthew 11, 28, and I thought someone needed to hear this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'd like to read it in Yoruba also. It says, I was so me go when it in shishe. Tia city dear ru, we will ole lori. A me yosi funi ni simi. A be a jagami wo. A quay colored on me. Into ri oni no tutu at your ni rele or coni me. And you see reason in me from a coin. Nitori a jagami wrong. A room is if we shall we rise to our feet. The Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I don't know what state you are tonight, I know what state I am. But I want you to sort of reevaluate things in your heart and ask yourself. Am I, am I trying to build up another kind of rock? Maybe you think you can build up money as rock. Maybe you think you can build up connections as your rock. But the truth is there's no other rock but Jesus. That is the impenetrable rock. That is the only fortress you can have where indeed you can be shielded from the darts of the enemy. And I want you to come back tonight and to say I hide in you, Lord. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, the rock that is better than me, the rock that is bigger than me, the rock that has perspective more than me, the one that understands more than me. Lead me to that rock. Tonight, Lord, my heart, our hearts are overwhelmed in different kinds of ways. Lead us by the hand to the rock. Let's go back to the rock. Let's go back to the rock. I want you to open up your spiritual mouth this evening and just drink. Drink from this rock. Drink from this rock tonight. Drink from this rock tonight. It says, come unto me, all ye that labor.